the Queen, Aretha Franklin. She was a traumatized child, a teenage mother, a gospel prodigy, and a civil rights champion. She channeled a world of pain into a sound all her own, but till the end, the greatest singer of her generation remained a mystery. I think of Aretha as Our Lady of Mysterious Sorrows, Jerry Wexler once said of Aretha Franklin. Wexler was the Atlantic Records producer who, in 1967, helped raise the singer to her sudden and incomparable soul heights. Her eyes are incredible, luminous eyes covering inexplicable pain. Her depressions could be as deep as the dark sea. I don't pretend to know the sources of her anguish, but anguish surrounds Aretha as surely as the glory of her musical aura. Those doleful eyes were sometimes mistaken for shyness. That was how a group of white musicians viewed her in a first meeting at Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, on January 24, 1967. Wexler thought the exploding Southern style of soul would bring out the best in the 24-year-old Aretha's still under-recognized artistry, even though she'd been making records since 1956. These were experienced session men, most had played with Wilson Pickett at Wexler's behest. Aretha didn't enter fame with a reputation as a soul singer, and she certainly wasn't overbearing, as some thought Pickett could be. And just suddenly, said famed songwriter Dan Penn, she walks over to the piano, she sits down at the piano stool, and I'm watching her. She kinda looks around, like, nobody's watching me. I thought she thought for just a second, is this not my session? And with all the talent she had, she just hit this unknown chord. Kind of kawunka kawunka kawung, like a bell ringing. And every musician in the room stopped what they were doing, went to their guitars, and started tuning up. That day and night would end up as the most eventful in Aretha Franklin's career, an unprecedented musical triumph and a near-terminal disaster. Franklin would later have little to say about the events. But then, she often proved reticent over the years. Yet others recalled Franklin as anything but timid. Mavis Staples, who had toured with her during their teen gospel years, thought Franklin was in fact inclined to devilment out of the public eye. One time she hid behind the tree with a baseball bat to knock her own sister on the head. Aretha was tough. Which is to say that Aretha Franklin was paradoxical and learned to be at a young age. From childhood on, she saw as much pain as she did glory. Her mother left her family when the girl was six, she had babies while still a child herself, she married a man who dominated her career and publicly battered her, she became a superstar, only to watch her matchless and lustrous career slide for too many years, to the indifference of almost everybody who had once applauded or empowered her. And then she witnessed deaths, too many, first her mother, then her father, after lingering for years in a coma from gunshot wounds, then three siblings, all lost to cancer. Aretha Franklin's voice, bred from gospel, blues, and jazz, American traditions that reached indelible glory because they had to overcome America itself, made all the difference. It was how, in the words of a gospel song she loved, she got over. You had a number of gospel singers who were filled with the spirit, said writer Peter Gurlnick. She translated that spirit into the secular field. She translated that feel and fire. More than that, Franklin's voice raised and defined her. Nobody came close to touching it, though she emboldened many others to follow her. Patti LaBelle, Gladys Knight, Natalie Cole, Shaka Khan, Whitney Houston, Alicia Keys, and Beyonce among them. More than any of them, Franklin possessed a roar that wasn't merely technically breathtaking, it was also a natural and self-derived instrument that testified to her truths in ways she otherwise refused to address. Some say Franklin was insecure at times in her gift, but with something so fearsome moving through their body, mind, and history, who wouldn't be both daunted and proud? Upon learning of her death in August, at age 76, from pancreatic cancer, Barack and Michelle Obama said in a statement, Aretha helped define the American experience. In her voice, we could feel our history, all of it and in every shade, our power and our pain, our darkness and our light, our quest for redemption and our hard-won respect. The late keyboardist Billy Preston, who started in gospel and went on to play with Franklin, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, put it in more rough-hewn terms, she can sing all kinds of jive-ass songs that are beneath her. 
she can go into her diva act and turn off the world. But on any given night, when that lady sits down at the piano and gets her body and soul all over some righteous song, she'll scare the shit out of you. And you'll know, you'll swear, that she's still the best fucking singer this fucked up country has ever produced. That singer gave nerve to people when they were being beaten down and killed, she saved a lot of lives. She probably even saved her own, for as long as possible. To get to Aretha Franklin, you have to go through her father. The Reverend Clarence LaVon Franklin possessed an almost blues-like incantatory style that became known as the Squall. The bluesman Bobby Blue Bland credited it as a considerable influence on his own vocal style, and CL's mastery of the form bore deep influence on Aretha. But CL and Aretha shared more than a vocal flair. Both were confident, ambitious, proud, even imperious, and both were dedicated to marking their place in history. Her father had bred her to be significant. CL was born in Mississippi in 1915 to sharecroppers who picked cotton for white landowners. His father abandoned his wife and child when Clarence was about four, and his mother married Henry Franklin, also a farm laborer. CL didn't want to be a farmer. By 18, he was a Baptist circuit preacher, and in 1936, he married Barbara Siggers in Memphis. Barbara was a skillful pianist, and according to Mark Bigo's Aretha Franklin, the Queen of Soul, as a gospel singer, Barbara Siggers was in the same league with Mahalia Jackson and Clara Ward. In 1939, CL secured a pulpit of his own at New Salem Missionary Baptist Church in Memphis, where he began to develop his legendary sermonic style. Following a subsequent ministry in Buffalo, New York, the Franklins moved to Detroit in mid-1946. The new Bethel Baptist Church had issued a calling, it wanted C.L. to become its new pastor. By this time, he and Barbara had four children of their own, Irma, born in Shelby, Mississippi, 1938, Cecil, Memphis, 1940, Aretha, Memphis, March 25, 1942, and Carolyn, Memphis, 1944. Barbara also had a son from a prior marriage, Vaughn, and C.L. had fathered a daughter outside the marriage, Carl Ellen Kelly, with a 12-year-old parishioneer in Memphis. The family settled into a mansion on East Boston Boulevard. Miracles would happen in Detroit, and also devastation, all essential to the making of Aretha Franklin. In Detroit, C.L. helped develop what became known as Black Liberation Theology, and became a friend and colleague to Martin Luther King Jr. C.L. proclaimed to his parish, We are black, not because we are cursed, for blackness is not a curse. White people conditioned you that way because they used this as a means to an end, to give you a feeling of inferiority. Aretha absorbed all this, and those implicit meanings would underlie much of what she would sing and how she would sing it. Starting in the early 1950s, CL recorded a series of sermonic albums, more than 70 in all, and eventually leased the masters to Chicago blues label Chess Records, he was called the man with the million-dollar voice. C.L. was adamant in his faith, but he was also worldly. He dressed in flashy suits and drove Cadillacs. Rumors attached to him, one involved gospel singer Clara Ward, with whom C.L. had an on-and-off years-long affair. Two years into the grand new life in Detroit, Barbara abruptly packed up and, accompanied by her son Vaughn, moved back to Buffalo. Irma told biographer David Ritz in respect, the life of Aretha Franklin, I do know that my parents' relationship was stormy and that my father had a violent temper. I never saw him strike her, but we were all very conscious of not inciting daddy's wrath. Aretha was six when Barbara left. During summer vacations, Aretha, Irma, Carolyn and Cecil visited their mother and Vaughn in Buffalo, where the two lived in what Aretha described as a pleasant, middle-class black neighborhood. Cecil later said, as much as Aretha adored our father, she would have been thrilled to live with mother. Dad made it clear that wasn't an option. All three sisters, Irma, Aretha, and Carolyn, had significant musical talents, but Aretha in particular developed as a prodigy. CL hired a piano teacher to polish his daughter's skills, but Aretha hid when the teacher visited. Playing by ear, she wrote, has allowed me to develop a rather personal and signature style, which I treasure and would not give up for anything or anyone. Smokey Robinson, a friend of Cecil, told Ritz, there was a grand piano in the Franklin living room. 
When Aretha sat down, even as a seven-year-old, she started playing chords, big chords. Mind you, this was Detroit, where musical talent ran strong and free. Aretha came out of this world, but she also came out of another far-off magical world none of us really understood. CL pegged Aretha as the family's likeliest star. She was flattered to be performing for late-night house guests who sometimes included famed entertainers, Dinah Washington, Oscar Peterson, Nat Cole, Sarah Vaughn, Arthur Prysock and Dorothy Dandridge were reportedly among visitors to the house. So were Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington and gospel great Clara Ward. It was Ward, more than anybody else, who influenced Aretha to become a singer. Aretha claimed she was around 10 when she sang her first solo at New Bethel, trembling beforehand, standing on a little chair, singing Jesus be a fence around me. Afterward, parishioners told CL, oh, that child sure can sing. In Buffalo, Barbara had been sick on and off. Though she was a nurse, nobody could figure out what the problem was. On March 7, 1952, on his way home from school, Vaughn saw an ambulance speeding by. His grandmother told him his mother had died only minutes before, a heart attack. Back in Detroit, CL gathered the children into the kitchen on East Boston and gave them the news. I just stood there, stunned, Aretha wrote in her memoir, From These Roots. I cannot describe the pain. Pain is sometimes a private matter, and the pain of small children losing their mother defies description. The children visited Buffalo to attend the funeral, CL did not. Let me tell you about the kind of child Aretha was, Ruth Bowen, who later became the singer's publicist, told Ritz. She was a traumatized child. Seeing Aretha in her father's church, Bowen said, she looked like a lost child. Her eyes were filled with sadness. Then when she got up to sing, this sound came out. It was gospel filled with blues. I mean, frighteningly strong blues, beautifully mature blues. After she sang, she sat back down and withdrew into her own little world. Her brother Cecil put it this way, insecurity invaded her spirit at an early age. I think that basic insecurity has never left her. In fact, I believe it defines her, that and her soaring talent. C.L. Franklin gave Aretha pride, stubbornness, faith and a kind of hubris. Barbara Siggers gave her a lacuna in which the greatness had to pass through to find voice. C.L. was the gospel. Barbara was the source of the blues, in all its haunting and transcendent ways. The blues is a way of feeling hurt and defying it, taking life as it is, living in the full hollow of it, yet going on. Aretha Franklin took her pain and transmuted it into something that moved the land with her voice. At age 12, Aretha became pregnant. This did not, by all accounts, blow up into a major family drama. CL was not judgmental, narrow, or scolding, she wrote. In my fifth or sixth month, I dropped out of school. My family supported me in every way. On January 28, 1955, she gave birth to her first child, Clarence. Aretha always refused to divulge the father's full identity, and he didn't stay active long in her life anyway. Then at age 14, in January 1957, she gave birth to a second child, Edward. She also declined to name this baby's father. At the same time, Franklin was maturing as a gospel singer. In the mid-1950s her father launched a successful gospel caravan, which toured the country, including in the Jim Crow South, where the troupe often had to take back roads and could not patronize segregated hotels and diners. The traveling members also gathered for after-show rites in which a different zeal burned. In Ritz's respect, Ray Charles and Billy Preston referred to the gospel circuit as a sex circus. Charles said, I love the church singers. When it came to pure heart singing, they were motherfuckers. When it came to pure sex, they were wilder than me, and that's saying something. Was Aretha exposed to these occasions? As Nick Salvatore wrote in Singing in a Strange Land, C.L. Franklin, The Black Church, and The Transformation of America, what arrangements C.L. made to shield her from the tour's nocturnal activities are not known, but her very presence unavoidably exposed her to experiences well beyond her years. But, as Salvatore wondered, can imperfect people perform good deeds? Can a flawed minister lead others to salvation? 
C.L. certainly thought so. In 1956, when Aretha was 14, she released her first album, Songs of Faith, with C.L. managing her. Because the music was mostly recorded at New Bethel with Franklin accompanying herself on piano before an open microphone, her vocals took on an incorporeal quality, world-weary and mystical at the same time. As Aretha wailed, Precious Lord, a listener in the audience called out, Listen at her. A great career in the gospel world was there for the wonder child's taking. Aretha was also smitten with secular black pop music. The new rhythm and blues, she said, couldn't be turned off. In particular, two artists had a formative impact on her, and she knew both as visitors to her father's home, Dinah Washington and Sam Cooke. Neither fit any single genre, both started in gospel, but proved endlessly transformative. Amalgamate the two, and you pretty much have the alchemy, for Aretha Franklin. Between 1948 and 1955, Washington had 27 R&B top 10 hits, and she became a pop star with 1959's epical What a Difference a Day Makes. She could be commanding, and she liked mink coats, parties, and pills, and in December 1963 she died in her sleep from an overdose of barbiturates. Cook was an even bigger star, and Aretha saw a lot of him, because his group, the Soul Stirrers, sometimes joined CL's gospel tours. On one occasion, after a show in Atlanta, Aretha visited Cook in his hotel room. The two were sitting on his bed talking, when a thunderous knock came at the door. It was Daddy. Sam and I froze in our tracks. Aretha, I know you're in there, Aretha wrote. At first chance, she shot out of the room, just when the conversation between me and Sam had taken another turn. Daddy never knew that with his intimidating knock, he changed the course of history. If Cook and Washington could cross over from gospel to pop, Franklin reasoned, so could she. When she told her father what she wanted to do, he didn't balk. The plan was to make her a star, said Carolyn, and make it happen quickly. Motown founder Barry Gordy and his songwriting partner Billy Davis wanted to sign Aretha. Everything that she sang was with such emotion that you felt every word, said Davis. She had just terrific control over her expressions. CL, though, thought that Gordy and Davis's ambitions were too local. To hit the big time, they decided that Aretha should move to New York, where she initially lived in cheap hotels. She left her children in Detroit under the care of her grandmother Rachel, effectively leaving them behind, just as her mother had surrendered her at a distance. She was 18. She and CL hired a new manager, Joe King. In early 1960, King introduced CL to Phil Moore, an arranger and jazz pianist. Moore sat down with Aretha at the piano, and they played a few songs. Then he turned to CL, and made the most prescient statement anybody ever made about Aretha Franklin, your daughter, does not require my services. Her style has already been developed. Her style is in place. It is a unique style that, in my professional opinion, requires no alteration. CL told Moore that he'd been thinking of trying to place Aretha with Columbia Records, and Moore knew the ideal producer, John Hammond, who had supervised Bessie Smith's last recording sessions and had discovered 17-year-old Billie Holiday. Hammond visited King's studio to meet Aretha and hear a demo she had recorded. He didn't need much convincing. He later said he thought Aretha was an untutored genius, the best voice I've heard since Billie Holiday. He signed her on the spot. Hammond produced her first Columbia album and had a clear idea of what he wanted Aretha to sound like. My vision for Aretha had nothing to do with rhythm and blues, he said. I saw her as a jazz-slash-blues artist. The singer's Columbia debut, Aretha, with the Ray Bryant combo, was released in late February 1961. She was 18. If the intent had been to cast Franklin for an audience that appreciated Lena Horne, Carmen McRae, and Nancy Wilson, Franklin instead arrived with a distinctive edge. The single, Won't Be Long, which peaked at number 7 on the R&B chart, worked as a precy for her later resplendence. Franklin performed it in her first national TV appearance, on The Steve Allen Show, and there she was, all the greatness already in place, as apparent as it would ever be. She hit the song off with big gospel chords on piano and sang with a witty, rousing, vocal majesty, in the last minute roaring startlingly.
It was around this time that Aretha met the man who, other than C.L. Franklin and Jerry Wexler, would prove the most significant figure in her career, for good and bad. Ted White would recall meeting Franklin at a club in Detroit, the 20 Grand. Her sister Irma had been talking to him around that time. She also told me, Aretha wrote, he considered me among the most beautiful women in the world. White dominated Franklin's career and schooled her in how to present herself in public. Franklin refused to discuss White much in later years, though in From These Roots, she wrote, I didn't realize I was in way over my head. Ted White was a take-charge kind of guy. Aretha's brother Cecil said that their father knew Ted was something of a shady character, and he thought the association would hurt Aretha. Motown producer Harvey Fuqua told Ritz, anyone who didn't see Ted White as a straight-up pimp had to be deaf, dumb, and blind. It took someone that slick to get a great talent like Aretha in his stable. Within six months of their first date, Aretha and White married. CL was bitterly opposed to the whole deal, he counted White as an enemy. In pop criticism, it became accepted wisdom that, with the exception of Unforgettable, a tribute to Dinah Washington, from February 1964, Franklin's Columbia years were miscast by both the singer and the label. In truth, the Columbia recordings were rife with songs of heartbreak and rapture, sung in a voice that even then was untouchable. But none of Franklin's Columbia albums were hits, and their mix of styles, show tunes, torch songs, blues, standards, novelties, pop and quasi R&B, didn't fit any easily identifiable demographic of listeners. It wasn't really me, Franklin said later. When it was apparent she would not renew her contract, the label assembled unissued recordings into stopgap albums. The label called one 1966 release Soul Sister, but it wasn't Soul at all. The real Soul Sister, though, was just months away. Wexler was a co-owner of New York's Atlantic Records, along with Ahmed Erdogan, and was feeling restless about the label he had helped build. Both Atlantic and Wexler were well regarded. Through the 1960s the label helped advance a more tenacious form of rhythm and blues that became increasingly identified as Soul. Wexler produced some of the most important artists himself. In 1966, he was in a recording session in Muscle Shoals, trying to stop a fight between Wilson Pickett and Percy Sledge, when he got a phone call from a friend, a gospel DJ, who told him, Aretha is ready for you. Here's her phone number. Wexler had had his eye on Franklin for a long time. The voice, Wexler wrote, was not that of a child, but rather of an ecstatic hierophant. On Aretha's first recording, her singing was informed with her genius. From the congregation, a man cried out, listen at her, listen at her. And I did. He called and spoke with Ted White, and in November 1966, she and White sat down in Wexler's office and made a handshake deal. I felt a natural affinity with the Atlantic sound, Franklin said. To me, Atlantic meant soul. Wexler had become enamored of fame recording studios in Muscle Shoals. It was owned and run by producer Rick Hall, who used sidemen whom Wexler admired, keyboardist Barry Beckett, bassist David Hood, drummer Roger Hawkins, and guitarist Jimmy Johnson. They were occasionally augmented by prominent session musicians like organist and pianist Spooner Oldham and guitarist Dan Penn, all of them white. Fame, Wexler decided, was where he would record Franklin's first music for Atlantic. White wasn't convinced. The Ku Klux Klan was active near Muscle Shoals, and still is, but Wexler insisted, and he met White and Franklin at Fame on January 24, 1967. The day that Franklin recorded in Muscle Shoals proved the most momentous in her history, it blasted open her future, then fell into a nightmare. Wexler played the musicians a demo of I Never Loved a Man, The Way I Love You, a song by White's friend Ronnie Shannon. At first, the band didn't know what to do with it. The song didn't have a specific meter, really, said Oldham. It was Oldham who turned it around. He sat down at a Wurlitzer electric piano and devised a new voicing, an odd slant of chords and cadence, to open the song. Spooner's got it. Spooner's got it, said Chips Moman, a songwriting partner of Penaretha sang the opening line, it was the first time some of the musicians had heard her voice. From there it was like sparkles and shine, Penn said. 
After everybody heard her sing, you're no good, heartbreaker, she had five instant fans. I can tell you, she was getting all the respect one person can get from those cats. Shortly, Penn and Momin went into a closet to complete a song they had been working on, Do Right Woman, Do Right Man. Wexler and the songwriters thought it might suit Franklin's remarkable voice. Completing I Never Loved a Man, The Way I Love You, took only a few hours. I couldn't believe it was that good, Wexler remembered. I had to get used to that kind of greatness. Then things went wrong, more than 50 years later, there are still mysteries surrounding that day and night, and nobody has ever been able to gather the full truth. Tension had been building between Wexler and Hall, whose session, after all, was this? Hall could be belligerent, Wexler wrote. So could Ted White. And so, as it turned out, could one of the trumpeters. The musician had been a last-minute add-on to the horn section. Also, there had been drinking, something Hall tried to forbid in his studio. White was drinking too, sharing a bottle with the trumpeter. This is where various accounts start to vary. The banter between White and the horn player resulted in animosity when, White said, the latter began to use racist terms, a redneck patronizing a black man, Wexler put it, and White told Wexler he wanted the musician fired on the spot. Since this was Hall's studio, Hall would have to do the firing, yet he resented being dictated to on his own property. Most of the musicians were oblivious. Wexler and Hall went back to Wexler's motel to toast the session, then White called from another room. He told Wexler that he and Franklin would be leaving in the morning, heading back to New York, he wasn't going to stand for this. Meantime, said one witness, Rick sees it going down the tube and decides to mediate. He shouldn't have done it tipsy. Wexler told Hall flat out not to do it, he'd only make it worse, but Hall wasn't a man to be boss. That evening euphoria turned to horror, wrote Wexler. It was Walpurgisnacht, well a Wagnerian shitstorm. Only three people were present in Franklin's hotel room, but nobody has ever given a uniform account. I went to Ted and Aretha's room, Hall later said. That just led to a bunch more yelling, with Ted telling me how he never should have brought his wife down to Alabama to play with these rednecks. Who you calling a redneck? I said. Who you calling a nigger? I'd never use that word. But you were thinking it, weren't you? I was just thinking that you should go fuck yourself. That led to Ted taking a swing at me, and before I knew it, I was in a full-blown fist fight with Ted White. According to one account, Franklin hid out in the bathroom as all this went down. Another has it that she got involved in the fight and helped throw Hall out of the room. In From These Roots, she wrote, I vaguely recall loud noises and voices, shouting and door slamming. I never learned the details. Hall reportedly called White from the motel lobby, suggesting he get out of town come the morning. Wexler told one interviewer, there had possibly been gunshots. Franklin wanted to live. Indeed, she believed God wanted her on earth, Aretha Franklin. Faith, combined with the instinct for self-preservation and buoyed by the world's love, really can make miracles. Franklin not only exemplified perseverance at the end, but all along she had given nerve, at crucial moments, to countless others who recognized themselves in both the pain and strength of her voice. She once defined her singing as me with my hand outstretched, hoping someone will take it. A lot of people took that hand and felt themselves raised up by it. Maybe we'll never know if that was enough to rectify the sorrow in Aretha Franklin's eyes. Rolling Stone teamed up with Audible to bring you an Audible original, transporting the listener through Aretha's tumultuous life, meeting those who most inspired her and those who caused her the greatest pain. Thank you.